Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to the webinar. My name is Dumelo Asahai, and I'm the facilitator for the first part of the webinar, and I will introduce my co-facilitator in a moment. The webinar is titled The District Health System in South Africa, Looking Back to Look Forward. It is jointly hosted by the PASA Health Policy and Systems Research Special Interest Group and the South African Learning Alliance for, Dist for the District Health Systems, in short, SALAD. I'll start off by introducing everyone who's going to participate in the webinar, and I'll formally introduce myself as well first. My name is Dr. Dumelo Asahai. I work as a lecturer at the Health Policy and Systems Division in the School of Public Health at UCT, and I'm also the incoming chair of the PASA HPSR Special Interest Group. My co-facilitator is Professor Lucy Gilson. She's a health system researcher and educator who has been supporting and thinking about the South African DHS development since 1995. And for those who would know, this is when the work for that green and orange book began. But formally, so she's the head of the health policy, health policy and systems division um, in the School of Public Health at UCT. We will have Dr. Eleanor Wiley, who is also a lecturer at the Health Policy and Systems Division in the School of Public Health at UCT. She's a member of the DHS review team, which as part of the salad basket of activities is currently wrapping up a review of the DHS policy process over the last 30 years. We will have Dr. Peter Baron, who has worked on PHC across government and non-government institutions in South Africa for the past 30 years as a clinician, manager, researcher, and technical advisor on policy and evaluation. And we have two guest speakers. The first one is Dr. Cheryl Nelson, the Chief Director of Primary Health Care at the Provincial Office in the Mpumalanga Province. And the second one is Mr. Jabulani Mdebele, who is the Chief Director of District Health Services at the Provincial Office in KwaZulu-Natal Province. The purpose of the webinar is to offer a historical account of the district health uh, system in South Africa, highlighting key milestones, milestones since its formation, challenges and opportunities, and concludes with a discussion on the district health system importance in light of the country's ongoing health reforms. Um, yeah, so I think we can continue from that. So as I said, or as the um, advert said, the, the webinar is hosted jointly by PASA, HPSR SIG, and the SALAD uh, group. The PASA special interest group um, is looking at um, advocacy and engaging different um, in professionals across um, the public health sector, academia, um, private sector, and so on, on issues around health policy and system research. Um, in the public health uh, discipline. In terms of SALAD, um, SALAD stands for South Africa Learning Alliance for the District Health System. It's a learning collective to develop and support partnerships to strengthen the district health services. It consists of academia as well, policymakers, practitioners, partners, others, for accessible inform information and knowledge and supporting evidence-based implementation. Um, it infuses, infused into the curriculum development pre-service and in-service. And in service. It's recognized by the Department of Health and other national agencies. Its current activities include writing and collating experiences. Uh, for example, we are busy with a series in the South African uh, Medical Journal, um, it also uh, hosts debates uh, and dis dissemination of information, and uh, it includes webinars such as the one that we have in currently and at this serve. So just a brief background on what the district health system is. Um, so I've pulled out the WHO definition, which says it's a self-sufficient segment of the national health system. It, comprise, it comprises of a well-defined population in a clearly delineated geographical, geographical area. It includes all institutions and individuals uh, providing care in the district, uh, whether it's in government, social security, non-governmental, private, or traditional. 
The DHS, the DHS therefore consists of a large variety of interrelated elements that contribute to um, activities that happen at community level, homes, schools, workplaces, etc., through the health and other related areas. It includes self-care and healthcare workers and facilities, up to including the hospital at the first um, refer referral level and what we call the district hospitals. So a sub-district as a unit, which uh, in WHO's terms is called a district, balances um, sufficient scale and scope to achieve quality outcomes, equity and efficiency, investment in management structures and systems, with responsiveness to local needs and context and the ability to coordinate actors and services. And why is the focus on the sub-district? Uh, in South African terms, a sub-district is, is roughly um, 1.4 million. And the district as defined by WHA, uh, WHO, the district population as defined by the WHO is approximately 50,000 to 500,000. So in the South African context, the sub-district is most closely resembles the ideal WHO district. And in terms of the NHI, the recent NHI bill 2019, the contracting unit for primary health care comprised of a district comprises district hospitals, clinics, or community health centers and ward-based outreach teams and provide pro, uh, private providers and private providers organized in horizontal networks within a specified geographical sub district area. So if you look at the national, the NHI bill, it talks about these CAPS, which is a sub-district um, unit and closely resembles what um, I just talked about in terms of the WHO definition. And in terms of the Astana, Astana Declaration, it marked the 40th anniversary of the Alma Mater Declaration on Primary Health Care and reaffirms some, some fundamental principles of primary health care and by implication, the district health system as a broad concept that includes not just service delivery, but also community participation and accountability and multisectoral action on the social determinants of health. And in the South African context, the district is enshrined as the fundamental unit and building block of our health system in the National Health Act. However, recently the district and the sub-districts are re-emerging as important foci of health system strengthening, driven di directly uh, or firstly by the renewed global attention to primary health care as outlined in the Astana Declaration, but also because of several other processes and initiatives, including amongst others, the NHI CAPS that I just mentioned, um, contracting units for primary health care, the imagine local and provincial experiments with COPC that we see across the, the provinces. That is just a brief um, background on DHS. I'm just, I'm going to next ask Dr. Eleanor to give us the history in terms of the timeline of the district health system in South Africa, where it started and where are we at the moment? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, so I'm here to provide an overview of district health um, policy making since 1994. And the work that I'm presenting today is really a collective effort. Um, and we call ourselves the District Health Systems Review Team, which comprises Tumelo, who you all just met, and Melissa Smuts, who I think is on the call, um, and myself. So just to acknowledge their expertise in this process. And then also just to note that I'm well aware that many of you will have a very deep understanding of the nuances and complexities of what I'm about to present. So please don't hesitate at all to contact me with any um, queries or omissions or errors. Um, the work is still ongoing, so it would definitely be, we'd love to hear if there's something that, you know, we felt could have been expanded on. So Globally, the sort of idea of a DHS was already well on the agenda by the mid 80s. The 1986 World Health Assembly urged member countries to strengthen district health systems based on primary health care. And there was an interregional meeting in Harare in 1987, which reaffirmed this commitment. In South Africa, by 1991, we already had a national health service delivery plan that decentralized primary health care to local authorities, but it wasn't really. Um, in practice achieved, and there were no guidelines on, for example, how to transfer primary healthcare staff down to the local authorities or anything like that. 
Um, in addition, some people argued that the existing health wards, um, for example, in the homelands, would help to create, um, would help to sort of lay the groundwork for a district health system. But of course, the sort of boundaries and administration of those health wards was often politically motivated, and this really undermined the sort of ability of them to contribute towards well-functioning district health systems. Um, it's also the case that, of course, this was all happening in the broader context of deliberate and long-standing inequities in healthcare. And by the end of the sort of pre-94 era, there was um, a lot of talk, for example, in the SAMJ, so many people calling for immediate investment in the DHS and saying things like, we cannot wait for the new constitution, it has to happen right now. So in this context, we go into the post-94 era, which was really a flurry of policymaking activity to establish the district health system and to build service delivery and management capacity at the district level. So in 1994, of course, we had the ANC Health Plan, which proposes community health services to be part of the district health system with a district um, health uh, authority responsible for managing all community health services. And in 1994, there was also a National District Health Services Committee established to start to shift from a curative um, sort of health system to a more PHC-based uh, health system. And it produced the first policy document for public comment, uh, which recognized that there would be a lot of variation in capacity in different areas of South Africa. So it gave three kind of governance options, the first one being a provincial option where the provincial government retains full authority for managing the district health system, the second one being a statutory district health authority where, where there is capacity but not a single existing um, entity, you would create a statutory entity to manage the district health system, and the third one, the preferred option, but which was relatively rare was the local government option where there would be a sort of local government authority taking responsibility for the district health system. In 1995, of course, we got the RDP, which is based on the ANC health plan, which decentralized healthcare and established the district health authority formally. In 1996, um, the district health uh, systems policy was adopted. And by this time, the demarcation of the, of the uh, districts was almost complete. In 1997, the district financing task team was established to address interprovincial inequities, and we saw the adoption of the needs-based allocation formula. And by 1999, district boundaries were really um, well established, and most districts had already appointed their management teams. And at this time, there was a real focus on capacity building for the district health system. So we saw the National District Financing Committee um, developing guidelines for conducting district expenditure reviews. There were also sort of publications supported by the NDOH, like the District Manager's Handbook and a Guide to, to District Health Planning. And at this time, the NDOH introduced the district health systems competition to generate best practice and reward health workers and institutionalize indicators and data for planning. So by 2000, there were 53 health districts, including six metropolitan districts. Um, the Local Government Municipal Structures Amendment Act was passed, which allocated the function of all municipal health services to district municipalities, rather than only environmental or non-personal health services. The local government elections at the, in December of 2000 really heralded the beginning of the sort of final stage of the transformation of local government with new boundaries and new councillors and paved the way for the full implementation of the district health system. So it was sort of the end of that first period. And also what happened in that period was that the RDP was... Um, that's a typo there, the RDP, not the RDR, was replaced by GIEF, um, which really restricted public spending, of course. And then the HIV um, uh, crisis was rapidly expanding. And, you know, by the end of 2001, about a quarter of all deaths were HIV related. And the National Health Act was still not passed. So we were entering a more difficult period in terms of focusing on the on the on the district health system as a as a focus of strategy and the next kind of era which is from 2001 to 2009 shows a bit of a drop in policy attention to the district health system so by the end of 2001 many provinces had established their provincial health authorities and in 2002 we had a draft national health bill which provides for the demarcation of the district it says provincial health authorities must help district health authorities to develop their own district plans and 
it states that local government must render municipal health services. But there was also this confusion brewing at the time regarding the definition of municipal health services. So the draft bill includes um, environmental health services, as well as promotive, preventive um, and curative and such curative services as are currently offered, all in that municipal health services basket. But in the same year, MINMEC agreed that um, this was too onerous for local government and suggested that municipal health services should be more narrowly defined. By the end of 2002, all provinces except KZN had established provincial health authorities, which were chaired by the MEC for Health. And in 2003, we finally saw the publication of the National Health Act, which formally established the DHS and defined the DHS as, and um, primary health care as provincial responsibilities and recognized the need to ensure quality in health care. Um, we also saw the launching in 2004 of the district health barometer and the beginning of the rollout of HIV treatment. Um, treatment. In 2005, the president proclaimed the National Health Act, so put it into effect. Um, so that was obviously cleared up a lot of the confusion that had been brewing in the absence of the National Health Act. Um, but also at this time, we saw a uh, gear replaced by ASCISA, which loosened up the national budget a little bit. But of course, this was also in the context of AIDS denialism. So that was really a period in which this, the pace of change, the pace of progress slowed down a little bit. Um, but in the next period, the sort of post-2010 era, because of the sort of NHI focus, there's really a renewed um, focus on the on the DHS um, and, and renewed efforts into strengthening the DHS. Um, the NHI was put back on the policy agenda in 2007 at the ANC's Paul Aquane conference, but it took a little while for the policy process to really get going. So in 2010, the NDOH adopt, adopted the PHC reengineering uh, program, and this was in line with the negotiated service delivery agreement, which um, it had establishing a well-functioning district health system as a core principle. And the primary healthcare reengineering strategy, of course, included school health and ward-based PHC outreach teams, and it stipulates that um, management capacity will be strengthened by decentralizing decision making to district management teams and facility managers. So this was obviously a boon for the district as a sort of uh, a, a, a foundation of the South African health system. There was also in um, at that time in 2010 the NDOH's. Um, medium term strategy uh, framework from 2009 to 2014, which included a 10 point plan that identified priority sub districts and included establishing district management teams in 52 districts. In 2011, we got the NHI Green Paper, which um, was released for public comment, and it proposes establishing district health authorities as a contracting unit for primary health care to be supported by the NHI fund. In 2012, the pilot districts were launched, um, obvious, and the, with a focus on PHC reengineering, ward-based ward outreach teams were established, facility improvement teams were established initially in a few districts, but then that was later expanded. In 2014, we saw the district health policy um, framework and strategy for 2014 to 2019 was published, with goals including improving district governance and leadership and management. Um, the Office of Health Standards Compliance was established and Operation for KISA, including the Ideal Clinic Initiative, kicked off. So you can see this is really a period where there's a lot of activity around trying to strengthen the district health system in preparation for NHI. In 2017, we got a policy framework um, for the ward-based primary healthcare outreach teams and the NHI was published at that time as well. And there's really a focus then on the sub-district level because as Tamilo said in her introduction, that is the level at which the CUPS operate. So the, um, the, the, that policy document really gives um, quite a lot of attention to other things that can be done to strengthen the sub-district level. In 2018, we saw the guideline for the establishment of district health um, of the district health management office, and um, in the NHI pilot evaluation reports, they showed quite mixed results with some challenges that are often to do with sort of broader issues like health resource shortages and that kind of thing. And of course, in 2019, the NHI bill was approved by cabinet, and um, we saw a kind of uh, the same focus on the CUPS as the kind of sub-district level contracting unit, but also a, a slightly reduced function for the district health management office. 
Of course, this takes us to 2020, where we see COVID. Um, we are working towards the, is the production of the new um, district health system strategy. But of course, in the light of COVID, and as we move towards NHI, there's a lot of unclarity. There's also budget issues. So it's quite a, I would say, a difficult and precarious moment for the district health system. I hope that's been helpful, and I'm going to hand over back to Tamil now. Thank you very much. I am now going to ask uh, Peter Baron to come over and um, give us a reflection or a summary of what Eleanor just uh, spoke to. Thank you. Over, Peter. Unmute, Peter. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks, Timelo. Um, but, uh, just following on what uh, Eleanor said, I'm going to give more of a, a personal uh, background uh, to the DHS having been part of this process um, from before it even started. Um, so back in the, I started working in the, in the health services in 1980 um, as a clinician for about six or eight years in various, uh, so um, in various situations and by by 1993, it was clear that there was going to be a change in South Africa. And what we had then was multiple departments of health. And there were actually 14 of them uh, with 10 homeland. Can people switch off? Can, they, can you mute the people who shouldn't be on? Anyway, there were 14 uh, departments of health with 10 homeland departments. And then within South Africa itself, there was one for each of the uh, <clears throat> the, the the various race groups and so by when 1994 came and the elect free elections i think the first thing that had to happen was a uh, elimination of racism um there were separate uh, entrances uh, at most facilities for uh, for different uh, people there was a uh, sexism I think if I stand to be corrected and people who were around at the time can, I don't think there was a single director uh, in the health system who was a woman. They were all men. And this, all this needed to be consolidated uh, into one uh, sort of workable uh, structure. So that was uh, the job. I was, uh, in 1994, I was a manager in local government uh, in Cape Town. Um, in charge of preventive services in Kailitsha. And there were several attempts at working, at merging the, the local government health services with the provincial health services. And uh, I can say that although the legislation is quite clear as to what should happen, um, 30 years later, the same local government uh, health departments and the same provincial health departments are still working uh, side by side um, and are not uh, integrated. And it's really uh, quite fascinating to think that 30 years of, uh, of this uh, and there's been no resolution of the problem. And I think the same thing applies in most of the big metros where the provincial um, health departments and local governments hasn't been able to come together. So that's still uh, an outstanding issue that needs to be resolved. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to skip this. This is really just looking at the uh, to what's happened in the white paper. Next slide. So I spoke about provincialization and local government was a huge, big uh, debate for many years. Um, as part of the development of the, the, the district, there was a couple of initiatives. Um, there was an equity project in the Eastern Cape where the focus was on management and the use of information. And then there was a um, health systems trust had an initiative for sub-district support. And I looked through the, some of the, the people who were on this call and Faith Kumalo, Beth Engelbrecht, Ronel Fisser, Steve Reed, Sarah Davids, and excuse me if I've left anybody out, all participated uh, in this initiative where groups of uh, um, public health uh, people who were 
expert in in the health systems got together to try and help districts and the district management teams um, to strengthen and improve the things that they were doing. And a whole range of uh, tools were published. And they, I think they, some of them are still pertinent now. So I put up the, the link where you can get uh, some of them. Next slide, please. Um, so just before I, I close off, I mean, it's very heartening to, for me to see uh, some people like Maylene Shun King and Rina Mora and um, Hassan Mohammed, who are uh, now public health uh, specialists who um, I sort of supervised for a small part of their careers. And it's nice to see how people have developed and uh, are taking this forward. I think that uh, in terms of the district health system, the glass is half full or half uh, half empty, but uh, I'd like to think of it as being half full. And much of the development of the district health system was uh, distracted by um, HIV, which sort of dominated, uh, in my opinion, the, the health uh, system in South Africa for 20 years at least, and still has a major role to play at the expense of developing more um, permanent uh, structures um, and government uh, um, accountability. And the, the focus was on the disease rather than on the system. But uh, hope, and also South Africa is just emerging from uh, the dark uh, 10 or 15 years. And it feels that uh, this group and salad and PASA, um, there's some more energy around the district health system. And I hope that uh, going forward uh, with the NHI National Health um, Bill and uh, Act still to be uh, um, promulgated, that the district health system um, is strengthened and that uh, management can take uh, accountability and responsibility for improving the services of everybody. Over. Thank you, Peter. Um, now we're going to move on to the second part of the of the program, and I'm going to hand over to Lucy Jason to to take us um, through that. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, and uh, thanks very much to all of those who contributed so far. It's my privilege to um, to be the facilitator for a discussion, um, looking backwards first, as we have been doing, and then subsequently looking forwards. And I'd like to invite our colleagues. Uh, Cheryl Nelson from Pumalanga province and uh, Jabalani Mdebeli from KZN, just to put on your cameras to begin with so we can see who you are uh, and where you are. And hi, Cheryl. Hi, Jabu. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, my role is to facilitate a conversation with um, Cheryl and Jabu around experiences from Pumalanga and uh, KZN. But we also would like to encourage everybody else to use the chat box to share their thoughts and their reflections on the questions that I'm going to ask Cheryl and Jabu. So please don't be quiet, please join in, use the chat box to, to make your presence felt. So the first thing I'm going to ask uh, the two of them, and let me forewarn you, Cheryl, I'm going to come to you first. The first question I'm going to ask is what you judge has been achieved in DHS development in your experience over time? Because it's a long history, we've done lots of things, but from your perspective and experience, what are the key achievements, Cheryl? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair, and greetings to all our webinar guests this afternoon. And of course, a special welcome to my Pumalanga colleagues and friends. I, we appreciate this opportunity to speak, and I must indicate that um, as a province, we have made significant progress in developing the district health system. And, um, you know, following the approval of the policy on the district health system in 1996, concurrently in Pumalanga province developed the Purple Book. I'm sure you can remember that, that book, Lucy, titled Primary Health Care in Pumalanga province, Guide to District-Based Action. That was in the same year the Blue Book was um, developed. And um, this handbook was endorsed by our former Honorable MEC, Kenneth K. Mashiho, 
MEC Health at the time we used to set, we, we were um, MEC Health, Welfare and Gender Affairs. And it, it basically took six months to develop the book. And um, the writers of the Purple Book um, included, I don't know if you remember, Maureen Beck colleagues, uh, Calvin Billinghurst, just to name but a few, Gulam Karim, David Durheim, Melanie Valmerans, Gladys Matibula, Judith Lubisi, and some of them are late, including um, Mr. Chabulani Ndebele, and um, uh, Eddie Mashamu, who is also, uh, um, you know, passed on, may soul rest in peace, peace. Uh, uh, Jogan Pillay and others served as resource persons, while uh, Peter Barron, Owen Friedman, Lucy Gilson, were among the reviewers. How awesome, awesome is that? So the changes that needed to take place uh, in our province was basically decentralization of healthcare services, adoption of the district health system, primary healthcare strategy as a delivery for universal healthcare, involvement of stakeholders in planning and so forth. So um, what has been achieved in our province? So our development of the district health system traces way back to 1996. And the achievements attained to date are centered around the principles of the district health system, highlighting significant progress. Um, in terms of e equity, we also introduced free primary health care services to all residents, ensuring that essential medical services are accessible to all, regardless of their financial status. And we also implemented a system of fair allocation of medical supplies across the province. It's still happening today, ensuring that resources are distributed uh, according to the specific needs per facility, facility thus improving access and outcomes. We also have an organogram that is available and is in the process of being revised, which of course we all know is imperative for promoting fairness and uh, consistency and equity in the distribution of resources. We implemented the CRTP comprehensive development plan aimed at fostering increased investment and development initiatives in rural areas, promoting economic growth and social well-being. So in terms of access to services, since 1996, there has been a significant growth in the number of health facilities in Malanga province, aimed at increasing access, of course. The number of hospitals increased from 27 to 33. You may ask yourself to rebuild new hospitals. It, it, in the main, it was due to revised demarcations of provinces where, for example, we inherited Bushpark Ridge, while our community health centers have doubled uh, from 22 to 60. Additionally, clinics increased from 199 to 232 to date, although there has been a decline in mobile units from 97 to about 92, but we also have satellite uh, clinics that we established. So the overall, in overall, the health infrastructure has expanded to better serve the growing population, speaking of which our population increased from about 2.8 million around 1994 to, to 5.1 million in 2023. The expansion underscores efforts to ensure that a, a larger population has improved access to essential health services across the province. We've also extended operational hours in some of our facilities. We're implementing the five streams of PHC reengineering. In terms of robots, we have 253 teams established. We have 5,348 CHWs, all of whom are on stipends. We have also successfully implemented the school health program. We have 76 professional nurses serving as team leaders for school health. We also have uh, established the um, health professional contracting, where we have contracted 59 general practitioners doing outreach services to our PhD facilities. In terms of youth and adolescent health services, we have 200. 30 of our 292 clinics who have established youth zones. In terms of emergency services, we each of our districts have an appointed EMS district manager. We are also implementing planned patient transport. And then health programs we have at, at the provincial district and sub-district level. In terms of infrastructure, we have improved um, infrastructure for healthcare delivery, and we are using the DER report to a certain extent, as it has a clear plan for areas that need uh, fixed PHC facilities. So of note is that all new facilities now are constructed using the clinical brief. I'm summarizing now, We, in terms of quality, we have clinical governance guidelines in place, and um, based on the National Quality Improvement Plan, we have established quality learning centers. Our facilities in terms of accreditation, 
we are happy to announce that of our 292 clinics with a recent assessment, 282 have, have um, acquired the status. And then based on certification with the Office of Health Standards Compliance, of the 292, 123 have been certified. And clearly we're on an upward tra trajectory towards implementing NHI. I'm sorry to interrupt, Cheryl. I mean, that's a, an amazing set of achievements that speak both to Mpumalanga's long history of district health system development and improvements in access over time that are really important. But I wonder, Jabu, um, for KZN, what would you like to highlight in terms of achievements? Over to you, Jabu. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, colleagues. Um, my approach on responding to your question will be following the six school building blocks. But before I can attempt to respond into your question, I will want to indicate that our definition as KZ and for DHS has been expanded. Because when we look at the definition of DHS, it only includes the district hospital. So in case that N, DHS includes all health services, whether it's your regional, your, your tertiary, they form part of the, the actually DHS, including forensic, your EMS, and the, the other areas. So coming to leadership and, and, and governance, as you will know that we, we have got well-established 11 districts. And in the 11 districts, we have got uh, the D, DHMTs that are fully functional, that meet almost on a, a monthly basis. They are responsible for planning. They are responsible for MNE. They are also responsible for, for development in the district. And then the other area that I would want to touch in terms of the provincialization, we managed to provincialize all clinic with the exception of Metro. But as a, uh, and, and, and as a province, we are ready to take on the, the Metro clinic. However, the issue is the resource constraint. And we also um, went beyond the, 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 the health sector reforms in terms of, of DHS. We established what we normally call OSS, which is Operation uh, Suguma Sake. So this OSS is meeting the principle of intersectoral collaboration. And it's also meeting the principle of local uh, community participating because it's happening at the world level. It includes all sectors, including uh, service. And then we just, you know, let's just then we could, uh, convene again. And then... Could you please mute? Thank you. Sorry, Jabu. Over to you. Keep going. Okay, so sorry about that. So I was just indicating how the OSS is functional. So it includes all we have managed to achieve that. When it comes to service delivery uh, issues, then we are currently, we have developed as a province uh, for the first time what we call an integrated health promotion and wellness strategy that doesn't uh, belong to health, but it, it touches all the department. So, so that is pro promoting also the principle of, of, of intersectoral uh, collaboration. We have got 10,200 uh, 10, community health workers, and currently we are mapping them where they are because the aim of the province is to have wall-to-wall -wall, uh, coverage when it comes to accessibility uh, on, 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 on health. We also uh, 
manage to do all the normal things when your ideal clinic, your ideal hospital framework, and, and the other areas. When it comes to health workforce, all districts have got delegation. They can appoint, they can uh, 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 recruit, and uh, so so that that delegation reside on them. And on top of that, we have also managed to develop what we call a regional training center, which focuses mainly on a lower level community development going downwards. And then in terms of your finance, we have got delegations in terms of the finance, and the delegation goes as far as one million at the district level, and 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 and, and also. The, 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 the challenge that we're still facing there is that district don't allocate the budget. It's still uh, uh, provincialized. And in terms of the information management, you will realize that we all in South Africa are utilizing your DHIS. We also have got HPRS, we have got SYNC, we have got TBHIV information, we have got your best. We have got your personal. However, when it comes to the outreach programs, we're still working manual, of which, and the other challenge is that this system currently, they are not, uh, there is no internal, uh, 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 they, they don't uh, uh, sync uh, 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 together. And then when it comes to technology, uh, uh, technology, we, we 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 not yet advanced in terms of utilizing the the the, 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 the technology uh, because of lacking of the resources but we we we, we have tried to actually uh, purchase some uh, technological equipment like your cell phone for the outreach uh, 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 teams so, so this is thank you Jabu. i wonder if i could ask you to wrap up yeah, this is how I can summarize uh, uh, the, 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 the progress uh, in terms of the development of DHS. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jabu. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. So um, in that which you spoke about, there's clearly been developments in all aspects of the health system at district level, um, uh, also including then the the operations Kubasake talking about intersectoral development, the delegations, such an important area of establishing um, a district system. So it, it feels to me as if there's complementarity between the Mpumalanga experience and the KZD experience. And perhaps that's no surprise considering the longevity of some of those of you who have been involved in district health system development over the many, many years that we've been pursuing this goal. We've shared in the, menti uh, in the chat box uh, the link to a Mentimeter, and we'd like to ask everybody on the call to use that link to identify for yourself a key achievement of the district health system in your experience. So we get a, a wider sense of what those achievements are. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I'll just also uh, highlight a couple of points of challenge that uh, Jabu at least spoke to. Jabu spoke to um, some of the t information system challenges that are ongoing, the need for more development in other areas. Cheryl, from Pumalanga side, what would you say is the perhaps the biggest challenge that you face at the moment? If I can ask you just to, to limit yourself to one uh, uh, as we watch the Mentimeter uh, work. Cheryl, from Pumalanga, what would you say is most important? So maybe I've lost Cheryl temporarily. Oh, no. Are you there? but I, it's good to see the, the Mentimeter cloud recording our achievements and it's important to be positive. Um, and I think that uh, there's some interesting things there. I think one of the lessons of looking backwards is, is really to remember that which we have achieved because as we are working within the system, there are every day so many uh, continuing challenges. That's the nature of health system change and health system management. And sometimes we can lose sight of the positives and the, and the gains. Um, Cheryl, are you there? Would you like to highlight one achieve, uh, one yes, challenge? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. 
One, one of the main challenges at this point is that um, we're basically in the final stages of developing the Provincial Health Bill. Mm. So our district health councils have not yet been established. Mm. So uh, the, one of the, the, the main reasons uh, that the bill has not been finalized is because we are busy aligning it with uh, the National Health Insurance Framework. Mm. But that has been one of our challenges because we all know what... Um, what the aim of having established the third councils is about. Yeah. So that is one of our key challenges, but also maybe to indicate that um, we also find ourselves with capacity challenges in terms of human and material resources mm. and the dwindling okay. um, budgets, you know. Sure, so sure. that, yeah, remains our key challenges. Difficult things. Yes, okay. thank you. I mean, the first point that you've um, raised the, it, it re reflects again the ways in which our policy frameworks um, take time to evolve and they don't always create a, a, a certain environment in which to work and one has to adjust them as new policy ideas come along. And I guess the district systems worked with that over time quite a lot. Um, I also just wanted to note in the chat box, there's quite a lot of engagement. Thank you so much with different um, uh, achievements being reflected there. Fantastic. Um, I noted that, uh, that there was also reference to collaboration in KZN with the university as part of those achievements. That's a, a slightly different issue. So thank you for raising that. And if we look again at the uh, the one, the two words or less that are being um, put up on our screen, um, we can see improved access there at the heart, CHWs, but a whole range of community involvement, also important issues to do with leadership and so on. Uh, whilst that uh, Mentimeter screen is still going, Jabba, can I come back to you and just ask from your side which um, other challenge or which key challenge you'd like to emphasize from the perspective of KZN? And again, I still encourage people to put things in the chat box. Thanks, Lucy. Mm -hmm. um, from, from, from my side, I think, you know, we do things and leave them hanging and don't mm -hmm. complete it mm -hmm. from the national point of view. So so, so we, we, we took a decision that we have to develop the uh, sub-district. So but national, that work is not completed. And currently, the bill is talking about sub-district. And uh, I'm not quite sure whether we do we, we have a complete definition. Do we have the same definition in, in Western Cape, in KwaZulu Natal, in Pumalanga, when we define what a sub-district is? So, 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 so that's one area that is a challenge. The second mm -hmm. area is the issue of the governance, the governance in terms of your, 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 your DHC that we are supposed to actually develop mm -hmm. and also your clinic committee and your hospital board. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will seem like we have got hospital and clinic board but for the sake of having them, mm -hmm. not for community participation, mm -hmm. not for 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 lead for them leading the system and hear and us hearing them. Yeah. Otherwise, currently the system is is the other way around. Mm -hmm. We tell the hospital board what to do, not the hospital board telling us what to do or the clinic yeah. committee what to do. So those right. it, those are the few areas that I would want to actually highlight and and, and 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 get a thought around it. Over. Great. Thank you so much, Darwin. So, again, the issue of the sort of pol policy frameworks and um, they take time to uh, adjust and then they have to be further adjusted. But then you've again raised also raised the issue of the governance structures and uh, the need for further development in those governance structures. Um, there's again some points in the chat box um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to pick up some a bit later, but I see the challenge from, um, from Pearl van Niekerk, How, uh, it, the goal given the goal of DHS, has the health of our communities improved? 
Um, and I see in the achievements, the Mentimeter Cloud, we've, we're talking about access, but are we talking about improved health? Cheryl, would you like to reflect on, on that point a little bit? What, what do you, how, how is it in Pumalanga in terms of improved health and uh, the, 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 the gains for the population? What, what do you see those as being? Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, we, we have experienced uh, in Pumalanga improved uh, health outcomes. Uh, I can start off by talking to life expectancy, life expectancy at birth. You will note that um, around 1994 or pre prior to 1994, our life expectancy at birth was sitting at 50 years. And uh, between 2016 to 2022, um, I mean, to 2021, our um, life expectancy at birth is at um, 60.4 as a province against the national target of 62.34. So, I mean, that is a key um, landmark in terms of our outcomes. As a province, we've we've also managed to reduce um, uh, maternal mortality, the maternal, maternal mortality ratio. Um, we were sitting at about 145, 100,000 in 2016, and um, in 2022, we're sitting at 92, I mean, 2022, 23, we're at 92.4, 100,000. And also, if you can refer to the district health barometer, 2022, 2023, that has recently been released, you'll see that um, as a province, in fact, around the antenatal first visit coverage, we are we're ranking fourth amongst the nine provinces with a coverage of 78.1% surpassing the South African average performance of 76.4%. I can go on and on and on, but mm. also just to note that we've also excelled in drug, sus uh, drug sus susceptible TB treatment success rates by right. achieving an increase of 82.8%, surpassing right. the South African average of 77.9%. So clearly there is improvement in, in, in our health outcomes, but mm. we do not deny the fact that there are still some areas that we need to still improve on. Sure. Great. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Really, really appreciate those those um, those data. It's helpful to to hear them. I mean, obviously, a question that people might ask is how the development of the district health system has contributed to that. But perhaps then we need to think about um, the access gains that we've discussed and that have been promoted and how that can contribute to improved health outcomes um, as part of a chain of improvement, if you like. I also just want to note from the chat box um, some comments about the importance of the resource reallocations that have been achieved um, over time with the use of the district health expenditure reviews that I know, uh, Cheryl, you, you, you spoke about. Um, and their use in reallocating resources better to support uh, primary health care and uh, how important they are in strengthening management at the district level as well. That's uh, a couple of points made there. Um, and I I'm now going to ask us to move on in our conversation, uh, Cheryl and, and, and Jabu, and um, think a little bit uh, about, given the experience over the last uh, the last number of years and the history of DHS development, the achievements and the challenges. Um, what sorts of lessons do you have and would you like to offer um, to the current and future stewards of the DHS? And before you answer, I'd just like to, to note, for example, that Natasha Berkowitz has, has raised the question, how do we ensure that a DHS remains and is flexible enough to respond to and evolve with the district's needs? So there's a sort of question we need to think about as we look forward. Um, but what are the, the lessons from our experience that can be offered to those who will be the stewards of the district health system moving forward? And um, Jabu, I wonder if I can throw that one to you first, as I know that's been an issue of concern to you. What lessons uh, of experience, what suggestions do you have to those who are coming after you? To, to, to maintain the district health system, move on the challenges and increase the achievements. Jabu, over to you first for your thoughts. Lisa, I think the question is, uh, is difficult. Uh, uh, but uh, one, one can say that, um, you know, I, I have learned through the district health system that the selective primary health care in future, it 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 catch you, it 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 can catch you up. 
for an example, if I can look on uh, during the 80s, 90s, um, where we put a lot of effort to manage HIV age, we managed to reduce the mortality of HIV AIDS more than 80%. People are no more dying from HIV AIDS. However, because we're selective, we're disease orientated, we're not people centered, now it's catching up. Because the same people now have got diabetes, uh, the, the other chronic diseases. And the issue around spending more time trying to deal with the social determinant for health is a crucial thing. I know it's, 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 it's hard work, but if we don't consciously, consciously build a system that is resilient, a system where we take the community along with us, then we'll keep on saying we don't have a budget or we have got a high number of defaulters because we don't go along with the people. We do things for the people instead of building the capacity to, to the people, developing them in order for them to actually do things for themselves. So, so, so that's the lesson that one has learned to say, hey, we need to go back. Let's resuscitate community-oriented primary health care. If we resuscitate that, at the long run, we are investing, we'll have a, 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 a number of gains. Unlike if, if we proceed currently like we were we managing a disease, not human beings, then we'll keep on, on dealing with those diseases because tomorrow there'll be that disease. The other day, there will be that disease. So, so the issue of building capacity to actually deal with a, a person who, who need to have a house, who need to have clean water, who, who, who need to also to be mental stable, you know, so so that's the perspective that one would want to share. Uh, over to you, Lucy. Thanks so much, Jabu. I like that phrase. We're managing human beings, not diseases. Um, such an important uh, thing to remember and the importance of uh, looking at uh, taking action on the social determinants of health, but taking the community along with us as the health uh, system, the health, the community are part of the health system. So it needs to be um, their work to improve health as well. Um, Cheryl, what are your thoughts on this question of lessons for the first future stewards of the district health system? No, thank you very much uh, once again, Che. And for me, um, one of the key lessons is around um, the current setup that we're having in terms of administration structures in sub-districts that have uh, obviously led to fragmentation of services between hospitals, community health centers, and clinics. There's also an inequitable distribution of resources, duplication of administrative functions, and difficulties in, in implementing costs, the cost center approach in relation to institutional financial management. So critical, um, Lucy, is the establishment and strengthening of sub-districts. We really, really need to find ways to maximize resources and increase health service coverage for the benefit of our communities. And this really, for me, and I'm sure for all of us, uh, can be achieved by ensuring that there is accountability closer to the environment where services are provided using um, the sub-district model for health services administration as the vehicle. That is one of them. And the other one is around HR and finance delegations. You know, um, there's no doubt that um, the centralization of authority, particularly on HR, impacts on appointments. And this basically has contributed adversely to the delays in filling of posts. And um, maybe lastly, another key lesson for me is around um, health information systems. And um, 
Am I still audible? Yes, you're still audible, my dear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're on health information systems. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think or I believe that implementing robust data collection and analysis systems is critical, critical for monitoring health outcomes and identifying health disparities and guiding resource allocation. So we definitely, definitely uh, need to invest in our health information systems. We are implementing the health patient registration system in the DHIS, but we know that these systems also need to be integrated so that we ensure uh, reliability in our data. So I think those for me are some of the key lessons because um, you know, if the data is not reliable, it becomes a problem in terms of planning. So that is one of the areas that I, I believe as a province and as a country, we really, really need to strengthen. Thanks, Chair, over. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So, so the importance of accountability closer to the people, the role of the sub-district in that, um, and of course the vital importance of the delegations around HR and financing to um, enable um, the management of, of services and engagement in the community at large and health information monitoring and evaluation being able to know what we're achieving and what we're not achieving in order to keep moving forward Jabu, does that prompt any thoughts for you uh, of other things you'd like to add as lessons for the future stewards uh, thanks uh, lucy uh, <laughs> You must realize that I'm obsessed with community-based um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, model. The other thing is that um, how do we prepare the training institution to produce the cadre that we need now? So there are huge reforms that need to happen at colleges that need to happen in university so that when we 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 we, we train people we tra train them to be fit fit for pe for, for for purpose uh, i must say that there's nothing wrong about curative services is good it has to be there but if it goes alone without the preventive and promotive health, then it's not going to yield better results. And currently, we have to realize that the PES is shrinking. If the PES is shrinking, it says we must do something, prevent people, more people not to have diseases, so that with the little money, that we have, we spend it on managing those that are critically ill. Mm -hmm. And that goes with the skills. You know, the skills at all levels, the management, the cadre who manage district health services currently, do they understand why, 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 why was the district health services uh, established? Where is it, uh, wh what issues? Was was it trying to to resolve? So it actually means that the leadership or the induction, the training that was provided uh, during the reforms, need to actually be resuscitated, so that we build the new cadre to understand why was the district uh, health system established. Mm -hmm. And also to put more emphasis or try to tweak the approach, put more emphasis on 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 the preventive and promotive and the approach. How to interact? If we talk about community participation, what does it mean? Does it mean you tell people and then they follow? So 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 it's a lot that need to be done. Over. Yeah. Thanks, Jabu. So that's a, 
a challenge to those of us who are working in education to to really enable the future generations to understand uh, what needs to be done. Um, and obviously, it's a challenge to those of you with the experience about how you share that with those who are coming after you. Um, Cheryl, last comment from you uh, of other anything else in terms of lessons that you'd like to put on the table? There's great stuff in the chat. I'm going to come back to that. Um, but Cheryl, last com comment from you. Thank you, Chair. My last comment is around, um, and it's a very serious one, the issue of um, security breaches. You know, with the increased crime in the country, as our facilities really do not have um, sec uh, adequate security measures, mm. you know, it's basically a major setback because, you know, we move forward and with the vandalism and and, you know, patient and staff safety that is being compromised, it's it's really, really becoming a serious problem, serious setback. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really crucial for health facilities to implement robust security measures to safeguard patient information and maintain the integrity of the operations. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one key, key, key lesson that's emerging right now for us. And mm -hmm. going forward, I think we need to work on this. Yes, thanks, thanks Cheryl. I mean, it, it's a reminder that the health system is nested in the wider society. And so the pressures of the wider society are ones that the health system also has to be um, very aware of. Um, I, I realized there was one question I wanted to throw to either one of you that was that was asked in the in the chat. What's the role of private practitioners in the district health system and for primary health care moving forward? Would um, I don't know, Cheryl, would you like a quick response on that one? Yeah, for me, the role is basically um, integration, uh, in, kind of like an integrated approach where we work as a collective, you know, because we're moving to one health system. Mm. So, um, you know, with the GP contracting and, and outreach services to our facilities, we've really seen an, an increase in terms of access. And in a way, we've also um, realized that the OPD headcounts in our hospitals where GP contracting is, is implemented adequately is has actually decreased. So uh, that partnership uh, for me is very critical and I think we need to, to strengthen it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and really appreciate Cheryl and Jabu, your, your input. We've had some great stuff in the chat as well and I'm sure everybody's looking at that. Um, I wanted to invite um, Peter to uh, just offer a last reflection. He started us off uh, in terms of reflections on the past, but Peter, your one critical lesson for the stewards of the future, what would you say, um, Peter? Well, I think that there's so many uh, educated, smart young people coming through the training institutions and that they should choose the, the public sector and uh, management as a career option, because um, I think that without having good uh, managers who are committed, nothing else can work. Over. Thank you, Peter. Uh, um, that's a great uh, lesson for the future. Thank you. Um, Zantaka from, I think from the Eastern Cape. Nontantla, would you like to offer a, a lesson for the future? I've been looking at your comments in the chat box. May I invite you to offer a lesson for the future? And maybe Nontlantla doesn't choose to or can't hear me, which is absolutely fine, um, or maybe is getting ready to respond. So in the meantime, perhaps I could go to Hassan Mohammed. Ma Hassan, you made an early comment uh, in the chat box, and I'd like to invite you also to offer a lesson to the stewards for the future. And please, if others on the call would like to offer lessons, put your hands up um, whilst I'm calling on people. Hi, Lucy, and, and hi, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, now I, the comment I made was just about understanding what we mean by a district health system. So there's a structure to it, but there's also a function. And uh, there, there was a very really useful comment made um, in the early days of the development of the district health system, which is about the district health system being sort of the interface between policy and operations. And um, 
you know, it's meant to be that kind of effective building block or unit of the health system. Um, but because of the way the district health system has developed, uh, you know, meeting that sort of criteria wasn't always um, easy. I mean, I use Cape Town as an example where we've got sort of 5 million people in one district, which is kind of not what, you know, which is a bit huge or large for a sort of a district management team. So one essentially does need another layer of the health system in order to, you know, manage and be more in touch with community needs. So I think it's really just about sometimes those early principles, I think as read out by Tumelo at the, at the very beginning, you know, what was the intention behind the, the district health system? And we should always be be grounded, you know, by by that uh, intention and, and just be reminded about the, you know, if we want an effective health system, what does it physically look like? But what, also what functionally uh, does it mean? You know, you want this effective management unit that's engaged with communities, but also is effective in doing, you know, intersectoral collaboration. But I'll, I'll stop there, but those that, that just sort of expands on the point I made. Thanks. Thanks so much, Hassan. Nontantla, I think that you may be yeah. unmuted, please. Yes, I was trying to unmute. I couldn't find it. Yeah. No thank worries. you. Thank you. Um, this this is this is is a very exciting discussion in terms of the DHS. For me, um, I think for 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 the upcoming uh, professionals in the in the public health, uh, uh, if if we can just now uh, with with the new reforms to make sure that by the time they leave the 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 education coming to the field there is some some information around this retail service because it's the key and and is is really the key in terms of uh, getting communities healthy and then when they get to the system i think the induction in terms of district health is where we're missing it to refocus them again to the to the population health to say uh, this is the community. If if is is the 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 the, the professional nurse is put in a, in a in a clinic, this is the population. They need to understand the community health, uh, and and then the community needs, and thereby they would be able to work now with the stakeholders in the community to influence health, and also uh, the, the, the 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 culture of listening to the community needs. And then, and thereby responding to them, because what we are faced with now are most of the complaints and demands. And then, if they can have that understanding and and be nurtured to 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 say how to 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 respond to community needs and involve them in the planning in the in the local sphere, yeah, that's that's the thinking that we need to to work on with the, with with the, with the education sector and also when they get to the platform. For, for me, that is that. And then as we introduce the new reforms, they will be really knowing how to integrate with the community mm. at, at that point. Yeah. Fantastic, Antletha, thank you. And, you know, echoing some of the important points that Jabu was raising about we need to work on community participation. We need to work on intersectoral action, but the yes. people in the system have to lead that. So we also need to think about the education or the, the training or the experience sharing, the lesson learning. I wonder if I could um, ask Klobi Langa uh, for views on the future um, and lessons for the stewards of the future. Klobi, what's your views? Good. Uh, thank you, I'm Lucy. Good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yep. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much for facilitating this exciting session. And thank you to Mr. Mdebele and Dr. Nelson for your insightful uh, uh, contributions. Uh, for me, uh, for the future, it is exactly as I have put it here on the chat, uh, 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 Lucy, to say that futuristic we need to start to think differently. We need to uh, shift how we uh, allocate even the resources. Uh, we need to, if we're serious about community-oriented primary health care, we need to look at the resource allocation at different levels of health care, 
Uh, I don't know if some of you might know this pyramid where from the up top there, from the central uh, tertiary hospitals to regional district hospitals up to community level, you find that there's there's more resources that are allocated at, at a tertiary central level, regional and district hospitals versus the resources that are at a community base a community level, which is the primary healthcare level. So for me, it is to look at the the the, the health system in a, in in a, in a different approach and uh, uh, concentrate on widening and strengthening primary health care or community-based uh, uh, services. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Chloe. There's really some uh, really important points being made. And again, in the chat, I, the chat uh, comments are really excellent as well. And there's some um, similar views coming through. And then every so often, there'll be a, a new and important additional thing. It's fantastic. We, um, I'm going to um, ask for one final input in this uh, part of the discussion. And I'm going to ask Krish Balabji if he would also um, share his thoughts on lessons for the future stewards of the DHS. Krish, over to you, if possible. Thanks very much, uh, Lucy, and really uh, well done to all. It was just an excellent uh, webinar. So so as I was thinking about this, I think, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity 30 years on to try and inject a fresh new energy into the district health service. Uh, I think what we've learned is the model uh, and the vehicle of a population-based, geographic-based uh, approach is tried and tested and works well globally and locally. Now what we need is, uh, and people have said we've been diverted from the HIV pandemic, we've had the COVID pandemic, etc. So these diversions would continuously come at us. The question is, how do we build a resilient health system that can learn from these pandemics and learn from other experiences and strengthen ourselves to come out even stronger. So I think that's uh, that's the first point. The second point is, I think, uh, you know, the reform journey is an ongoing one. And so stamina and perseverance is quite important. And I think uh, we must all brace ourselves for the long, the long haul because there's no sh short term quick fixes uh, uh, to this. And uh, I would uh, also want to say many of the speakers have spoken about the overwhelming focus on curative care and how do we lift our heads as health managers and start taking uh, a broader stewardship role that looks at social determinants from an intersectorial point of view, looks at community ownership, looks at a broader population-based approach uh, uh, to the DHS. And my last comment would be strengthening from the bottom. So I think, you uh, you know, uh, Eleanor showed us the long history of policy development and a very strong one uh, at that. And the question is, how do we power the system from below? And there's a huge, a huge opportunity there that we must continue to embrace. Thanks very much, Lucy, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Chris, for those, those great additional reflections. And thank you to everybody who's contributed in this part of the webinar. I think we've really heard interesting um, uh, ideas about the achievements, some of the challenges, but most importantly, the lessons for the future and how we take forward the continuing work of district health system development. I want to assure everybody on the call that we will be um, seeking to, to develop a, a short note drawn from the um, from the chat box, from the inputs to be able to share more widely. We'll also be seeking to, to share the recording more widely as well. It's been such a rich conversation. Um, and really from the beginning in terms of looking at that history, the timeline that Eleanor presented, looking um, Peter's reflections backwards to look forward only propelled the conversation. And the enthusiasm and the passion and the commitment to further developing the district health system is really clear to see in the chat box. So so thank you to you all for your contributions at the moment. And uh, I'm going to hand back to Tumelo to wrap up this webinar. Uh, thanks again to Cheryl and uh, Jabu in particular. But Tumelo, back to you um, to wrap up the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much to Lucy and the guests. Um, we've all heard of the long history and the expansion of, of services across the years and all the achievements and challenges that we're still facing. And I think for me, I take away the, 
you know the the some of the challenges that we're still facing is how how do we make the governance structures uh, how do we formalize them and how do we make them effective uh, how do we integrate services how do we automate uh, health information in preparation for the nhi how do we move towards a people centered health system how do we bring communities on board and integrate um, all these at the community health um, system level but also importantly how do we strengthen uh, sub districts in preparation for nhi and especially for the establishment of the of the cups um so i'm just going to make a few um a few um announcements and i'm just trying to find my slides again so thank you very much for everyone who has participated so far and all the comments, very valuable comments that you've seen in the chat. And we'll be making um, summaries and notes of this webinar and make them available. But just before I talk about where to get the recordings and the, and the presentation, um, Salat will be hosting the next webinar on the 15th of May titled Navigating Resource Management at District Level. We invite you again to attend this. Um, um, especially people in the provinces, just, um, you know, as we're trying to share and build this community around knowledge uh, um, around the DHS. Um, this will be a first of several other um, webinars with district financing and budgeting focus, and it will be hosted by Salat in conjunction with um, the Health Economic Unit at the School of Public Health um, here at UCT. And just finally, if you want to join the PASA HPSR listserv, you can send an email to me. Um, but also, if you want to join the SALAT listserv, you can send an email to Caressa Gavenda. That's her email, and we'll put those in the chat. Um, and finally, the recordings will be available on the YouTube channels of the UCT School of Public Health, as well as the UWC School of Public Health um, channel. And with those few words, I would like to say thank you, and we close here. Bye-bye, everyone. If we can just um, put on our cameras and see who is here. <laughs> Bye-bye, colleagues. Great to see everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.